when we look back, I think it's easy for us to say that uh, we planted some seeds uh, and the seeds began to germinate. But of course, as with all issues of change, uh, the growth has been cyclical. You know, there will be moments when uh, we are feeling something good is happening. But then very easily uh, another moment comes when you take a lot of steps back because of you know, one event or the other. And the reasons could vary and, and, and are diverse and dynamic. Uh, we have had instances where whole communities have been brought down in what we call evictions. And, and so you lose everything, including all the little investments that you have made uh, when that happens. And Mombasa has had quite a number of those forceful evictions that have taken place in quite a number of uh, the informal settlements. Uh, there are moments when, you know, Mungano, you know, has litigated, gone to court, and we've got rulings that are affirmative and positive and on the side of the poor. But when it comes to implementing the outcomes of these rulings, you rely on the same state to do this. And often the state is in bed with the rich. Uh, and somehow there's a way in which uh, they agree. And uh, the outcomes which you felt, you know, are going to come through, you know, fall through the cracks. And uh, what was victory becomes uh, an extremely frustrating exercise of chasing government to do what it was committed to do by the courts. And what that does, it dampens the spirit of everybody else who is in the struggle. And so we've lost quite a number of people from the struggle who have then felt it's just not going to work. So all our victories have somehow had this uh, this uncertain lining that, you know, it's a victory, yes, uh, but it's short-lived, it's not long-term. Uh, when we passed the Constitution in 2010, we were all extremely hopeful. and We thought maybe now we have uh, dealt with the structures and institutions and systems. <laughs> Little did we know that, uh, you know, when the Constitution says Parliament shall enact legislation to give effect to this provision, that that Parliament could enact that legislation in a, in a way that actually takes it away. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a consistent you know, behavior and pattern in Parliament where legislation is made that defeats the very purpose of the Constitution. We have to run to court again for interpretation and, you know, all manner of things. And, you know, in, there's a way English law works. Yeah, it grinds really slowly. <laughs> and it's really never on the side of the poor. I mean, uh, and so I keep taking people back to, you know, let's go back to good old organizing. We've got to fight this system and, you know, perhaps that will achieve something. Yeah, but so that, in a sense, has been uh, our experience. But we have also made quite a number of strides. We can today very, uh, you know, confidently say that the discourse around eviction guidelines is there. I mean, the, the, the country is aware that even if you were to evict, that there ought to be some humane, you know, approach to it, that there are guidelines and although the guidelines haven't been passed but that they're in the public domain and they've been debated is something we can speak about. We also know that we have a bill that is articulating the issue of community land and, and it's a very specific legislation that talks to the issues around community land and some of the urban communal settings would fall within you know, that rubric. You know, so that then we are not going to alienate community land as if it was ownerless, as if it was idle, you know, as if it didn't have you know, people who manage it and so on and so forth. And so notions of community land management and community agency in their land is something that is taking root. And if the law, the bill becomes law, 
uh, you know, then there will be some useful steps that we will have made. And it will be steps that are rising out of this uh, d discourse that has gone on for some time, both here in Nairobi and uh, Mombasa. The changes that are taking place at the supranational level have had impact you know, up to the ground because we now have a county system that we didn't have before. Where, apart from the national government that was the head, you have also another government at the local level you know, that you can fall back to and run to. And that government at the local level is also receiving quite a huge chunk of what we call the local budget. And it has a very specific mandate, you know, planning, uh, it has a budget cycle, and it has staff who are supposed to deliver services to the community. And so that has sort of shifted us, you know, out of chasing Nairobi into chasing, you know, for example, Mombasa County and uh, the six billion that goes there. Uh, and in a sense, it has added to our headache, you know, that you're not only chasing one government that is led by Uhuru, but you know, several other entities at the local level. Now, depending on the temperament of each of those county governments, sometimes things work, sometimes they don't work. Mombasa County, for example, is now going through a plan they're calling uh, re renewal of the city or redevelopment or something. That's what they're giving. Them. And this is intends to to redevelop all the low-cost houses that the state had built you know, many years back that have of been offering some sort of relief to you know, the urban civil servant and the worker and some very reasonable rent that now the county wants to redevelop them and modernize them and uh, you know, put them out there for tenant purchase. And so we are debating with the county and saying, no, the concept of public housing makes sense. And that's where our constitution is. So you can't privatize you know, public housing and purport that you'll be selling to these individuals, uh, these houses. Even if you were to sell to them, these are just a few individuals. This city needs public housing for as long as it exists as a city. And so we are having that argument uh, right now. And our argument is very difficult now because the movement has lost its ballast. The movement is weak. Uh, in the movement, there are people who think that's the way to go because they have seen drawings. And I think there's a sense in which uh, architectural designs have glamour. And so it's glamorous for some people in the movement. Uh, and they think, you know, really that it's important. The county wants to develop the county. And so why do we want to maintain these old houses? Uh, and so we have lost the intellectual resources, which I think the movement, when it started, was very strong about. In, in the 70s and the early 80s, ideological discussions were very strong. And perhaps this is because of the Cold War and some of the debates that went on in institutions of higher learning and so on and so forth. And so we generated a very conscious class then. But the numbers uh, of those who are on the right has increased and is increasing. Uh, the argument that people want to get rich quickly seems to be the currency today. Uh, this discourse about the poor uh, no longer is not very fashionable. Uh, and, and, and so like the rest of the world, I think we have suffered uh, that gap uh, in knowledge, uh, which then makes it very difficult to explain and nurture the movement when the movement is divided ideologically. Uh, and a lot of people want easy uh, shortcuts and quick wins. And often quick wins are very difficult to find, uh, especially when you're talking about things as difficult as providing services for the poor, subsidizing, and you know, doing all sorts of things.
that uh, support the poor. And then we have the overall reform framework where there's a lot of push by the World Bank and uh, a lot of the people, the governments who support our government, you know, that that support comes with conditionality. And often that conditionality will be one thing or the other that pushes the poor further you know, out of opportunity. For example, uh, China is doling a lot of money for pro projects, mega projects in the country. And our country, in its vision 2030, believes uh, that you can develop by in inviting foreign direct investment, which, by the way, is not new. <laughs> Uh, and, and if it was the thing that can generate magical development, then today we will be so developed. But I think that's how our country looks at it. But then what happens with these mega projects is that then the Chinese give us commercial loans and then they take the contracts. And so, in a sense, the working class has lost out in that discussion. And so the people who benefit are the merchants in government who also double up as our leaders and then the, the traders from China and other places. And, and, and so it's very difficult for national programs, uh, the types that we are looking for that can support the kind of sector that we are working in. And, and so there's a lot of disillusionment amongst uh, you know, members of the movement. 